Let's go ahead and open our Bibles to John chapter number 11, where we were right in the middle of the story of the resurrection of Lazarus. Now, the story starts in Perea, which is the tetrarchy of Herod Antipas, which is located on the east side of the Jordan Valley. And Jesus has gone to this area of Perea uh, after the Feast of Hanukkah, Feast of Dedication that happened in December of 32. Uh, And he's been ministering there very effectively for the last couple of months. So more than likely, we are now somewhere in the month of February of AD 33, just a matter of weeks from Jesus' final trip to Jerusalem, where he will become the atoning sacrifice for sin. Uh, So Jesus gets a message from Bethany, which is right next door to Jerusalem. Uh, It is a message from some close friends of his, Martha and Mary, whose brother, Lazarus, is gravely ill, and they've asked him to come and heal him. Jesus remains in Perea ministering for only two more days, and then he announces to his apostles, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. Let's go. And uh, the apostles are like, no, if he's fallen asleep, that means he's going to get better soon. And besides, the last time you were in Jerusalem area, they tried to stone you. And Jesus says, no, I didn't mean he's fallen asleep and is getting better. I mean he's fallen asleep as in the euphemism for he's dead. And I need to go and reverse that. I need to go take care of that. Uh, Jesus actually says, I'm glad I wasn't there when it happened, for your sake. And I told you as we were closing up, I believe this is because Jesus needs the apostles to see him resurrect someone several days after their physical death. They've seen him resurrect people minutes or a couple of hours after their death. But never have they seen any resurrection farther out than that. In fact, the scripture doesn't have miracles of resurrection uh, farther out than the day of the death. So this is going to be a big example of Jesus' resurrection power shortly before his own death and then resurrection. So it's going to help them Uh, understand just how powerful uh, Jesus is. So the last thing we read was the response of one of the apostles to Jesus insisting that they needed to leave that day and head off to to the Jerusalem area, to Bethany, uh, right next to Jerusalem. And the person is Thomas. Verse number 16 of uh, John 11 says, So Thomas, Tomas, called Didymus, which means twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. Uh, So Thomas's name in Aramaic and in Hebrew has the idea uh, that indicates he was the second of two babies born, uh, two twins. Uh, So Thomas is like, well, if he's going, we ought to go. And if he's going to die, we need to die with him. So Thomas shows some conviction here, uh, which needs to be taken into consideration along with the other thing we know him about, which is when Jesus has resurrected from the dead and been seen by other people, Thomas says, well, unless I see him personally, unless I touch his resurrected body and know for sure that it's him, I'm not going to believe. And so we think of him as doubting Thomas, but I think he's actually um, basically Thomas of great conviction, uh, as indicated here. Now, verse number 17 moves us ahead in time a couple more days. 
So Jesus was speaking to his apostles about Lazarus on the day of his death. And then he arrives uh, at Bethany on the fourth day after the death. And, and the way we count it is the day of his death is day one, and then two, three, the day of Jesus' arrival is day four. Uh, so uh, it takes apparently about three days uh, for them to make the trip up to Bethany which means more than likely they were in the northern portion of Perea uh, whenever this happened. Uh, so they make the trip across the Jordan and then from Jericho up to Bethany. Uh, verse number 17. When Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. Uh, it's only about 15 stadia. It's less than two miles. It's something like a mile and a half or so. Uh, take you maybe 30 minutes uh, to walk the distance. And so the reason John brings that up is because of this. Verse 19, many of the Jews, meaning the Jews of Jerusalem apparently, had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So Martha and Mary, the household here, is known fairly well in the area. Uh, they appear to be a fairly well-to-do family, maybe a merchant family, uh, maybe somehow related into uh, the leadership families. Uh, so they are getting a lot of uh, of condolence traffic coming to Bethany from Jerusalem. Verse number 20. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, uh, Jesus probably sent a runner ahead to let them know uh, that he was going to stop just outside the city to wait for them to come to him. Uh, Jesus is probably thinking about how his sudden appearance at their house of grief might draw all sorts of attention and bring controversial uh, confrontations that really have no place uh, when uh, a, a Jewish family is grieving over the loss of someone. Plus, he already knows that he's going to go to the cemetery and resurrect Lazarus from the dead. Uh, so he doesn't go to the house. He waits elsewhere. And so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Uh, Mary apparently doesn't know that Jesus has arrived uh, Martha appears to me to be the elder of the two sisters. I actually think she's the eldest of the three siblings. I believe she is married to a man named Simon, who was a leper that I believe Jesus cleansed. That might have been the beginning of this relationship several years earlier. I think it might have been as early as the beginning of Jesus' ministry period which we know took place at Jerusalem, uh, at the Jerusalem region. Uh, so uh, Martha, as the Eltis, goes to see Jesus. Verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now she speaks those words out of grief, I think. Uh, because they'd sent the message uh, that he needed to come, and he didn't make it there before the death occurred. And uh, that, that is upsetting. They wished that Lazarus could have been healed like so many other people had been healed. 
Now, at this point, though, verse 22, Martha expresses some faith that there is something yet to be done. And this is how she expresses it. Verse 22, but even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Now, we've recently talked about this in my Sunday school class, and the discussion went back and forth about Martha's faith at this point. Did she expect Jesus to resurrect her brother from the dead? And her wording here in verse 22 does seem to indicate that. But what she says in a moment seems to move away from that. And so I am a little bit uncertain as to what's going on here in Martha's mind. Uh, And that shouldn't really be all that surprising because when people are suffering from grief, they don't always think straight. And so uh, let's continue on and see what else is said here. Verse 23, Jesus said back to her, your brother will rise again. Now, how does she take that? Verse 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. It seems as if Martha takes Jesus' words as a reference to ultimate resurrection. Uh, That Jesus was saying to her the same thing that she's probably been hearing from other people visitors of condolence. I'm sorry for your loss, but one of these days he will resurrect again. Because the Jewish faith was about an ultimate resurrection in association with the coming kingdom. And so Martha seems to take Jesus' words as a reference to that final event. Jesus then said back to her, I am, and that's that ego emi in Greek. It's the Greek wording from Exodus chapter 3 when God says, I am whom I am. Uh, John makes sure that we see this a lot in his gospel. Uh, In the mouth of Jesus, because Jesus spoke it, first of all, but also because it it emphasizes Jesus' identity as God himself. Uh, But here it has an object. I am the resurrection and the life. So Martha says, yes, I know there's going to be this last day resurrection. And Jesus' response is, well, I am that resurrection. I am the life of eternity. Whoever believes in me, though he die physically, we're talking about here, yet shall he live. Uh, This is something that gets spoken by Jesus quite a bit. It causes controversy that we've talked about already. And that is physical death is one thing. Spiritual life overarches physical death. It overwhelms spiritual death. It trumps spiritual death or physical death because even if our bodies die, if we have an intimate relationship with God, our relationship continues after that physical death. Remember, Paul talks about uh, being absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So Jesus is highlighting the distinction between physical death that we grieve over and the spiritual life that continues after death. Uh, Verse 26, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. None of us, none of us are going to die if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, we may physically die still, In fact, the vast majority of us will. Uh, Only that final generation will have some of them that are still alive and remain when the Lord comes and their bodies will be transformed. Uh, 
The vast majority of us will physically die, but on the day of that death, we will still be alive and in the presence of the Lord. We need to believe that. And that's what Jesus is trying to get Martha to believe and actually asks her, do you believe this? Do you trust me in this, Martha? And then she states a great confession. She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Now, I don't know why we don't give as much credit to her as we do to Simon Peter in his great confession. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This woman right here says pretty much the exact same thing. In the midst of her grieving over her, I think, baby brother's death, she says to Jesus, I believe that you are the Lord of the life. I believe that you are God's son. I believe that you have come into this world to give us all life. And so we need to give credit where credit is due. Martha is a woman of great and abiding faith. Verse number 28. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The rabbi, the teacher is here and is calling for you. So Jesus told Martha at their meeting, I need you to go back and get Mary to come here. I want you to tell her I'm asking her to come here. Um, So, again, Jesus wants them out of the house and in his presence so that they can go together to the cemetery. They don't know that yet, but that's the reason why. So, verse 29, when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him, uh, probably at the outskirts, uh, not far from the the city's uh, cemetery, graveyard, because that's their ultimate destination today. Now, when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Uh, Now, modern-day Jews, Jews through the ages, uh, have similar customs to what clearly existed at this time, Uh, something referred to as sitting Shiva. Uh, It is a grieving period, a mourning period, that extends a week or more after the death of the loved one. Uh, The burial in the first century took place as quickly as possible after the loved one's passing, typically on the exact same day. And then they would receive condolence visitation through the next week from other family members and neighbors and friends, members of the community, members of the extended uh, community. And so that's what's happening here. Four days after the funeral, uh, they're still receiving visitors uh, at the house. Now, these visitors, the moment they saw her pop up and take off, they assumed that she must have wanted to go out to the tomb itself and continue some of her grieving process. Maybe they assume that's why Martha took off as well, and now Mary wants to join her. So they figure, we'll just move our sitting Shiva out to the graveyard. Uh, Verse number 32. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, She fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Those are the exact same words of her sister. Uh, Jesus does not go through the exact same interaction with her that he went through with Martha. And I think it might have something to do with 
the the status of each of them in the family. Uh, as I've already told you, I believe that Martha is the older sibling, that she's married, and that her younger siblings, Mary and Lazarus, are living in their home, that is, in the home of herself and her husband, Simeon, or Simon. Uh, it could be that their parents had died, and so Martha became uh, the, the guardian of her younger sister and brother. And so uh, Mary is, I think, likely to be an unmarried teenager, and that Lazarus may have himself been only a teenager, and that makes his death even more grievesome, doesn't it? So when Jesus saw her weeping, verse 33 says, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping. Now there were paid mourners that usually showed up for the funeral on the day of grieving. Uh, their grieving was often a performance. But in the days that followed, it was typically the genuine friends and relatives that set Shiva, that grieved with the family. And so Jesus is seeing here the people that really are sad about Lazarus' passing, that they are brokenhearted, that Mary and Martha are grieving over the loss of their brother. And so when Jesus saw Mary weeping, Martha's probably crying as well, and he sees the Jews who had come with her, they're also weeping. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Uh, we all understand this feeling. When you are in the presence of those that are brokenhearted, it touches you. You, you can't hardly stand it. Um, especially if you care about the people. I'm, I mean, I'm kind of tearing up right now just imagining being in that sort of environment as I have been in in many times. And so Jesus then said to them, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And then, verse 35, Jesus wept. I, I've used this passage at several funerals in my ministry life to remind people, Jesus cries with you today. Jesus grieves with you today. He knows your broken heart at the loss of your mom or dad or brother or sister, son, daughter, cousin, friend, whoever it is. Jesus cares. And that, that sympathy, that empathy hits the other people that are there that day. It says here in verse number 36, So the Jews said, See how he loved him. They knew that Lazarus was somebody special to Jesus and that it was hurting him to have to be here at the grave site that he's going to, to have lost him. But they also say this, which sets the stage for us when we continue this story next week in next session. It says in verse 37, But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man the man that was born blind that Jesus had fixed earlier in this story. Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? That's their way of saying, if only he'd gotten here sooner. If only he'd been here quicker, then Lazarus would not have had to die and we would not be here crying today. And then the miracle of Jesus' resurrection power is demonstrated.